Sometimes when roller coasters close, enthusiasts shed a tear. Sometimes when coasters close, enthusiasts are indifferent. But every so often, there's a coaster so bad that enthusiasts celebrate its closure. Meet T3 at Kentucky Kingdom. This was one of the most infamous roller coasters in the world. This was a coaster so bad, even the park's own public relations department made fun of it. So it's no surprise Kentucky Kingdom recently announced this coaster would close for good. In this video, I will review T3 and speculate what may happen next. Bolger and Mabillard wowed the coaster industry in 1992 with Batman the Ride at Six Flags Great America. This was the world's first inverted coaster. This placed riders beneath the track and gave them the feeling of flight as they navigated a series of intense inversions. B&M's phone was ringing off the hook. Dutch manufacturer Vacoma wanted a piece of the pie, so they quickly developed their own inverted coaster. Named the Suspended Looping Coaster SLC for short, the prototype would go to Wallaby Flevo in 1994. That park is now known as Wallaby Holland, and this rise none other than Condor. The SLC occupied a fairly small footprint and was designed to be cloned, but it had a major drawback. It was extremely rough. Despite this, Eight parks ordered one for the 1995 season, and I really have to ask myself a question. Did those parks bother to ride the original before dropping seven to ten million dollars on their brand new ride? I'm thinking they didn't. Seven of the eight SLCs that opened in 1995 would have a slightly modified and updated layout. This would become known as the standard layout. These would stand seven feet or two meters taller, feature modified banking, include an S turn before the final breaks and have increased capacity. The one remaining SLC to open in 1995 will be a clone of the prototype, and that would be none other than the one going to Kentucky Kingdom, which opened in spring of 1995 as T2 Terror to the Second Power. Not sure why they selected the prototype layout, but I'm guessing it was either related to the cost or lead time. This particular layout had some major issues. For one, it tracked more poorly. Condor and T2 have been widely considered to be two of the roughest coasters in the world since their inception, even more so than the standard SLC, which is still considered pretty darn rough. Second, the trains had to be shortened. T2 was going to have three 10-car trains like the standard layout, but it could only accommodate a 7-car train. This meant each train could only hold 14 riders, which was extremely low for a giant thrill coaster like this. T2 has undergone a series of changes since its inception. The ride opened with Red Track. The park was purchased and rebranded as Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom in 1998. Just one year later, T2 was painted all black. The rumor was that the coast would be rethemed to Batman, but the name change and retheme never happened. After the 2009 season, Six Flags ceased operations of Kentucky Kingdom, putting the park's future in doubt. The park sat idle for years, but it was saved by Ed Hart. He had previously guided the park through its massive expansion in the 1990s, an expansion that included the addition of T2. Kentucky Kingdom reopened in 2014, but it would be missing a big ride. T2 was sitting idle. The ride would reopen in 2015, but not before a big refurbishment. The coaster would be updated to T3, Terror to the Third Power. The ride would receive all red track and supports, allowing it to really pop behind the park's colorful water park. But the most interesting change of all was the new trains. When the coaster ran as T2, it had the standard Vacoma SLC trains, just shorter than usual. These featured bulky over-the-shoulder harnesses. When paired with how rough the ride was, this led to a ton of headbanging. Vacoma actually offers an updated SLC train with vest restraints that eliminate all headbanging. This has helped mightily in rides like Riddler Revenge at Six Flags New England. Condor actually received these exact trains in 2021, but more on that in a bit. Rather than using the ride's original manufacturer, Kentucky Kingdom hired Kumbach to manufacture two all-new trains. These would feature just seven rows of two like the old trains, but the restraints were way different. You would have a bulky bar over your thighs and straps over your shoulders. Nothing would go next to your ears. This too is effective at eliminating headbanging, but the harnesses cause another issue for a lot of riders. 
the high positive G-sections could force the restraint downwards, crushing the thighs of riders. This never personally bothered me, but I also should add I don't come off Hershey Park's Sky Rush, aka Thigh Crush, in pain, so maybe I have a high tolerance to something like that. I've heard some describe the new trains like polishing a turd, and I get the analogy. They eliminated headbanging, but they did not address the root cause, the shaky track work. Both Condor and T3 continued to be rough. While you wouldn't smash your head, the awkward transitions would jostle your body. The worst issue for me is when it slams you forwards and backwards on the inversions. That being said, that's far more comfortable for me than headbanging, but it comes down to personal preference. Some may find what T3 does to be worse. The only way to totally fix an SLC is to give it updated track. That is why the new ones like Roller Coaster Mayan at Energylandia are fairly smooth. One park actually gave their SLC a full retrack, and that would be none other than Maurice Piers' Great Nor'easter. That ride went from brutally rough to fairly smooth. There's a reason that one is widely considered now to be the best SLC. T3 had a dubious reputation among coaster enthusiasts. Despite this, the ride still drew lines. It was Kentucky Kingdom's one inversion-based coaster, it also did not help the ride had a low throughput. That became even more of an issue after an incident of June of 2018. Two of the trains bumped in the station. The ride reopened just two days later, but I believe it ran with one train ever since. If you wanted to ride T3, it was prudent to head there early in the day before the queue line backed up. The most comical part of all this was that Kentucky Kingdom was routinely bashing the ride on their own social media pages. How many parks do you know of that refer to one of their own rides as a torture device? I'm waiting. Well, that will happen no more. In an email sent out to season pass holders a few days ago, Kentucky Kingdom announced that T3 would be retired. Note they didn't say removed, they just said retired. So what does that mean? I think there are two possibilities. First, the ride could receive another refurbishment to give it all new track like Great Nor'easter. The coaster could then reopen in 2024 with a new name. Second, the ride could be removed and replaced with something altogether. Ideally, another inversion-based coaster. As much as I love airtime, the park already has several rides focusing on that. As rough as it was, T3 was the one adult coaster that did something different. It did fill a void in the park. Which do I think is more likely? T4 or an all-new coaster? I'm leaning towards the all-new coaster. It is no secret that T3 doesn't have the best reputation. The park was recently acquired by Hershen Family Entertainment, who also owns parks like Silver Dollar City and Dollywood, and they had no part in the builder modification of T3. So I suspect the new owners would want to distance themselves from a ride with a checkered history and add something brand new. But we'll see what the future holds. The fact they decide not to open the ride for the 2023 season suggests they want to start working at the site fairly quickly. So definitely keep your eyes peeled over there to see what's going on. So what did we lose in T3? The ride began with a slow climb up 102 foot or 31 meter tall lift hill. This was the park's tallest coaster, so it offered solid views of the park and Louisville in the distance. I also like how the Vacoma inverts don't have anything beneath you so you can fully appreciate the height. Compare that to a B&M invert with a catwalk beneath you. Once you crest the top, you navigate a twisting first drop to the right. It's not as steep as the later SLCs, but it rode similarly. The drop is reasonably smooth, but the pullout would deliver a bad jolt. It would also deliver nice positive Gs that, as I mentioned earlier, could tighten your harness if you had an issue with that. Next was the rollover. This was the roughest part of the ride. It did not track well at all. You got good G's going up and down the element, but that roll high above the ground was a bit problematic. There were nasty jerks in each flip. It would try and snap your legs from your body. After the rollover, you navigated a twisted camelback. On the standard SLCs, many people refer to this element as a wave turn. On those versions, the banking starts before you hit the apex. On T3, the track did not bank sideways until you start the dive back down to the ground. Don't expect any airtime here, just expect some more shuffling on the twists downwards. This led into the third inversion. 
a sidewinder. The train slowed down mightily at the top, causing a bad jerk throughout the train. That was followed by a shaky 270 degree spiral. It was one of the roughest parts of the ride after the rollover. Then came the final two inversions, the double barrel roll. The entry into this element has a decent foot chopper, but the clearance was reduced in later SLCs to enhance this visual. The barrel rolls themselves were fast and disorienting with some laterals. There was some more bouncing, but nothing too bad. It was smoother than the prior three inversions. Then came the finale. You had a big turn followed by a dip and a rise up into the brakes. On later SLCs, this section has an S-bend. Now I actually liked the simpler finish better on T3. This section doesn't really do anything on standard SLCs, it's pretty boring. And considering how shaky the prototype SLC layout was, I welcome less changes of direction. You then hit the brakes and return to the station, ending the 2,172 foot or 662 meter long coaster. This was just a smidge less track than the standard SLC, which makes sense given the modifications I've been mentioning. Now one quirk before you departed is that you had to press two buttons on the handlebars to release the restraint. Based on their position, it feels more like you're firing a gun than undoing a harness. So what would I rate T3? I would give this coaster a 3 out of 10. This ride was very flawed. It tracked poorly, and it would treat your body like a rag doll. With the old trains, this would have been a contender for the worst coaster in the world. But with the new trains, it was an above average SLC, and I didn't come off in pain. It was still a bad ride though. I would actually come off laughing how awkward the ride was. Throughout all the jostling, I did enjoy a few of the elements at least like the positive G's and the double barrel roll. And I'm glad Vacoma finally found a way to make this layout smooth years later, because it is an action packed and thrilling layout when it's not trying to harm you. So those are my thoughts on T3, the now defunct inverted coaster at Kentucky Kingdom. What are your thoughts on this ride? Did you find it to be one of the worst coasters in the world? Or did you actually take some form of pleasure in the experience? Let me know down in the comments. Likewise, let me know what you think will happen to this ride or the site where it resides. If you enjoyed this review, I would appreciate it if you gave this video a like and you considered subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster and amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.